Awesome. Um, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Eric Beauchart. Um, I'm the co-head of uh, media entertainment at the Forest Road Company. We're a, we're a specialty debt lender in the entertainment film space. And I'm really excited to be having this conversation um, with David Kaplan, Kristen Convitz, and Nick Marshall, um, three very, very esteemed panelists and um, uh, people that I had the pleasure of knowing over the past couple of years. Um, we're, we're really excited to have this conversation and thank you for the, uh, for the members of, um, of South by Southwest and all the attendees for tuning in. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off with uh, saying that this is something that I'm personally very excited to talk about because um, anytime I get to talk about the resilience of the, of the independent film industry, um, it, it's, it's kind of what, what gets me out of bed in the morning. I think that 2020 was um, uh, disproportionately hard for independent filmmakers. And so I'm excited to talk about what, what, uh, what 2021 uh, has in store for, for all of us. Um, not only that, but at the time we're recording this, we're just coming off of um, also an unprecedented festival, um, which uh, it's unprecedented in the way it was uh, way it was launched and the types of sales that we're seeing and the type of content that's being created. I'm really excited to talk to to, to you three about this. Um, so why don't we why don't we go around and introduce um, introduce you all and and then we can uh, we can get started. Um, Kristen, we can start with you. Sure. Uh, I'm Kristen Convitz. I am an agent in the independent film group at ICM Partners. Uh, we help to spearhead projects through the entire kind of independent process, starting from raising financing, packaging projects, casting, all the way up through the finished film and getting it to a festival, the festival strategy, and then uh, ideally the domestic distribution plan um, and everywhere in between. So we represent projects specifically, not necessarily people, um, and help them navigate all the treacherous waters of independent filmmaking and selling and distribution and all that. So that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Nick, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is Nick Marshall. I'm the EVP of uh, production and operations for Maven Screen Media, um, which is a UK uh, and New York based company um, that's headed by Celine Rattray and Trudy Styler. And we're a um, production development and financing company for film and TV. And I do all the really, all the really sexy and exciting stuff. In film. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It's all sexy and exciting. Yeah, exactly. right, right. Great, thank you. David? Uh, hey everyone, I'm David Kaplan. Uh, I'm an independent film producer and entrepreneur uh, and uh, I've most recently spent the last eight years running a company called Animal Kingdom, which I co-founded alongside another uh, indie producer named Joshua Astrakhan uh, and uh, have gotten the uh, great good fortune to get to produce a bunch of movies, exec produce a bunch of movies over the years, and uh, and also get to run a business that uh, up until 2020 was really focusing not just on the film space, but also on television and audio and video games. Uh, we have our first video game, which actually came out today, uh, which is exciting. It's a game called Blue Fire, uh, which uh, is on the Nintendo Switch for anyone who has it. Um, and uh, and yeah, and uh, and now as of the last few months, have gone back to producing and. Uh, and other sort of side projects. Very nice. And I, I was playing Forest Nintendo Road, Switch last night. Uh, got to download it. Uh, there <laughs> you go. It's a steal. That's awesome. Um, Nick, Nick and I have been fortunate to be part of uh, a, a few projects together. But David, I've been trying to trying to get David's project for, for quite some time now. Um, so I'm excited to see what 2021 has in store for, for, for us. Um, I, we'll start with the first question here, because, and I think it's a really interesting one. Um, I, the, the question that I have here is, is what's the most valuable lesson you learned about your particular business since, since the world essentially shut down? I, I think it's a, I think we could probably spend three hours talking about um, the answer to this question. Um, but Kristen, I want to start with you because I think um, uh, you're seeing the, the, from an agency perspective, you're seeing um, 
a lot more shifts in, in the way things are being distributed, things are being financed. And so can you walk me through probably the, the maybe the top biggest shifts in your particular field um, and, and, the, and the lesson you've learned from them over the past, uh, over the past year? Right. Um, so from a kind of 10,000 foot view of how things have kind of progressed over the 10, last 10 months, um, you know, I think the biggest takeaway is uh, the resiliency of it and the ability to try and pivot and figure out how to make things work given the constraints or certain circumstances that were completely unprecedented <laughs> over the last year. Uh, I think, you know, the indie space over the entire like 15 years that I've worked in it has always hit these road bumps where it's like, it's over never coming back there's no way it can survive you know the indie market's dead we should all get new jobs <laughs> which i think happened again last march when everything just kind of collapsed all yeah. the productions we had that were about to go you know got put on pause uh film sales itself also completely paused for a number of months and then as things went on i think people started to realize that audiences still wanted to see stuff and we had to figure out how to make this work. And, you know, once again, the indie market kind of like figured out how to pivot and make it work. We did a virtual can. We had a Toronto that was in entirely virtual and we started doing film sales uh, completely, you know, disconnected or, you know, just virtually connected to buyers and figuring out how to create or an event or a marketplace around a film. Uh, I don't necessarily think it, it worked in every case. So mm -hmm. it's been a trial and error for sure about how to, uh, what works and what doesn't work, uh, how's the best way to approach it. I, I think we're still probably learning mm -hmm. that, but we uh, have figured out how to create a marketplace, I think, uh, for certain types of films. And I think Sundance was certainly an example of that because mm -hmm. I think now five films have sold. Um, one of which was ours, mm -hmm. <laughs> a film yeah. called Coda, which was the biggest Sundance sale ever. Oh. So that kind of combination of like, you can have these incredibly, um, you know, amazing groundbreaking things happen, but at the same time, we're trying to figure out how to uh, make the smaller films kind of work or how you create a market around those without having a festival itself or having a ton of reviewers coming because that's even been diminished. Um, it's a constantly rolling process, but the kind of overview of it is we're just trying to roll with the punches and trying to figure out how to make it work. And thus far, there have there's been a lot of setbacks, but there's been a lot of successes. We've had two of our biggest sales ever in the last six months in, as a group um, and as a company in terms of the independent sales group. Um, and uh, trying to find new ways to kind of engage with buyers and audiences. Uh, that's, you know, a, a learning process. But right. uh, we're, it, it, it's unknown and you got to figure it out how it goes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and so, so the, uh, so your, your business is really, um, is really uh, almost, almost seasonal because you're really, uh, you're making films and trying to get films in the can in time for the festival submission. Um, and so when those festivals are either being canceled or completely changing, um, can you walk me through the, the first couple staff meetings of realizing in, in March with, with South by and then with can and then TIFF and, and AFM and uh, realizing that, okay, this, this isn't going away. The, but the, and so therefore the festivals kind of are, um, how do we strategize with our filmmakers and, and set them up for the, for the right expectations? And then Nick, I'd like, I'd like to have you comment on that as well. Uh, it's tough because from a, when I think of from a filmmaker perspective, it's really, uh, it's probably pretty frustrating and upsetting 
to have your world premiere, your like moment at Sundance or your moment mm -hmm. at Toronto be entirely virtual and sitting in your living room. That's not how people <laughs> envision that happening. Mm -hmm. And you don't get that festival fever. You don't feel the excitement of the room. You don't have that moment to introduce it to everybody. Um, it, so, so that it loses that shine mm -hmm. a little bit which then affects the buyer side, of course, because they're sitting in their living room watching a movie, you have no control over that environment at yeah. all. You don't know what they're doing. Uh, are they pausing it, making dinner, whatever it might be, um, the reality of, you know, uh, quarantine life. Yeah, uh, right. that, that environment's not controlled anymore. So we tried to figure out how to pivot that. Obviously, we did a lot of drive-ins where we did some sales screenings where we invited people via that to make it kind of an event. We provided, you know, branded candy and that kind of stuff and make, make it more interactive with people. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of the virtual stuff, I think Sundance did as, as I guess, good of a job as they were able to, under the circumstances, they had drive-ins planned, they had to eventually cancel, but trying to make the actual virtual premieres from your living room somewhat, you know, giving it a sort of a shine that maybe it wouldn't normally have and having these like virtual parties, which, you know, remains <laughs> to be said of how cool those yeah. could possibly be or compared right. to an actual Sundance party. But um, yeah, it's just about trying to figure out new ways of doing things where it's not just sending a link to somebody because that it doesn't serve us well and it doesn't serve mm -hmm. the filmmaker well. And, you know, it's not really doing justice to the process. So with each right. film we, we took out, it was a very kind of targeted, like, how do we make this something special and make people pay attention to it? So right. it's a, I'd say uh, it's a much more involved process than it used to be because it was like you just you try and get into a festival. If you don't get into a festival, we do a sales screening. And it was a very kind of um, established way of doing things. So now right. we're just, again, just bringing it back to like pivoting and trying to do new things and trying to be, you know, do something new to engage buyers or um, audiences. Right. And then from, you know, from the, from the producer standpoint and, and David, I'd love to get your feedback on this as well. Like, how are you, uh, it, especially it Maven seems to be kind of, it, it lives for the festival. Almost every film that y'all do gets into some major film festival. So it's a matter of, um, you know, how, how do you set the expectations of your filmmakers and how is your business shifted um, since the ca cancellation or the shifting of the festivals? Well, I mean, I guess with one film that we had that actually, thankfully, we just finished shooting <laughs> just before the lockdown happened, which was very lucky. You know, mm -hmm. with that one, we've decided to kind of hold off on, on selling it for a bit because we really want it to be... It's, it's really a film that you do really need to experience with an audience in the cinema. So that's right. kind of the decision we made on that one. Um, and you're right, in terms of festivals, I mean, we're actually, you know, the, the film that we did earlier in the year um, within, you know, was obviously not designed with that in mind. We, we came up with it um, in COVID. It came about purely because of that. Right. Um, so that's a different one entirely. But I guess now, I don't know, we're, we're, we've got a new movie that we're going into production in um, this month. And, um, you know, and we, we're still going to aim to have it in a festival. Like we understand, obviously yeah. everything's different. It doesn't look like it did before, but I think we just keep going. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. what we're going to do. Right. You know. And so, and and so, David, how is your business? Um, I know you've shifted a lot over the course of the past, you know, twelve, fifteen, sixteen months. But tell me how much of a result of 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 that was was uh, was COVID, and and how much of it was just kind of a natural iteration of of your business and um, you know, some, some big takeaways from, um, you know, from what you've learned with the, with pivoting during, uh, during a pandemic. Yeah, I, I think, um, it's, uh, I think a lot of the decisions that, um, the company made prior to COVID, um, were ones based on I, the way the industry has changed over the last however many years, um, you know, the, um, 
the value of um, the, the increased value put upon an intellect, established intellectual property, creating your own intellectual property, being able to make things uh, vertically where you can make the podcast and then make the TV show or make the podcast and then make the, um, and, and control all the rights. Uh, I think mm -hmm. that was, that was all part of a strategy of just trying to figure out how to monetize a business that at its core is trying to make independent films, uh, which is not a great business at the end of the day. Um, I think we can all probably agree that it's not, it's not maybe a terrible business, but it's certainly not a great business. Um, uh, and I think, uh, and I think, you know, the t there are a lot of takeaways from that, but I think we would have needed to spend a lot more time in those spaces to really learn and understand the the pitfalls of all of them. Um, I, I think, you know, the, the state of the festival um, it going experience right now uh, and going forward, at least for the near term, I, I can't think makes me any more or less um, inclined to make a film right now. I think the, because I, I think you're always hoping that a film will even get into a top tier festival. And if you're not getting that, um, the sales prospects of a film that's made outside the system decrease say, meteorically. And, and it's, and it's, so you're already playing such a game. I think you're already, the bet you're making is that you're going to make a film that somehow stands up against the entire world. And that's, um, that requires, it requires a certain kind of blindness or lunacy. So, you know, I think, I think the bigger question right now is what are the stories that feel worth telling? What are the stories that feel like they can actually manage to achieve that um, in 2021 or 2022 when the um, a vying for attention is such a, um, you know, a part of the daily um, grind now. So I yeah. think it's, uh, I think those are probably the questions and make, and that maybe makes me less inclined to produce a film versus something else right now, because I think the space is just challenging. Um, but I don't know how much of that's COVID versus the direction things are already going in. Right. It sounds like, and this is kind of the, the consensus that, that we've come up with internally is that um, all of the massive shifts that have been happening in the distribution space and the content creation space and the technology space, and the festival space are all just kind of COVID was just an acceleration of the trends that were already in place. Um, and it's, it just, it, it, it shortened the time period for which all these things, these things were going to happen anyway, by probably five to 10 years. Um, when you're, when you're talking about the type of content that's being made in, or the types of scripts that you're receiving or the types of films that you're viewing, um, do you see a difference in quality? Do you see a difference in, um, you know, the amount of action films versus, versus rom-coms versus horror? I think a lot of the um, budding filmmakers and South by Southwest attendees would be interested in, in knowing what, what types of films are interesting from, a, from, a, um, from an audience grabbing standpoint in, in, in 2020. And I'll, and I'll leave that one to the floor if anybody has um, initial thoughts. Are we talking about films that we're getting right now that can be COVID friendly? <laughs> yeah, I think from a from a production, you know, from a production standpoint, it's uh, it's it's um, you know, I, I think that's that's the easier question, right? Is what can be made for in like exactly. that's, that's in there's a, a house. difference between things I like to champion and yeah. things I think the market is interested in versus what can actually get made right now. Right. Um, so, which is a very yeah yeah. Small. So what I, I'd, I'd be <laughs> curious to know what you think the market is interested in right now. Uh, well, Netflix said uh, they're an entertainment company, not a truth to power company. So I guess we know what Netflix is interested in. Um, <laughs> Amazon didn't buy the Khashoggi doc um, because uh, they have interests in the Middle East, even though Khashoggi worked for the put paper that Bezos owns. So they're not a truth to power company either. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know. What, what do people want? Uh, things that reinforce the neoliberal world order? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So go out and make those South by Southwest. Yeah, thing. well, I mean, that's, if they're lucky, they'll get to do that. Right, right. That's interesting. Nick, do you have thoughts on, on the types of projects that you're seeing and how they're different from, um, from the projects that you were seeing in 2019? I mean, 
not to be honest not really um i'm sort of we more focused on you know what Kristen said a minute ago is like what what can we make like what do right. we have that we love that we were you know that we're willing to put all our time and energy into right now in this crazy you know pandemic state we're living in you know right. what, can, what can we actually do at this time so um right. So I'll, I'll ask a question then to, to ask you a question about that. Um, just to jump on that a little bit. Are there are there hard and fast things that Maven looks at when it's looking at a project that says, these things are probably too hard to do right now? Are there places you don't want to shoot? Um, not to go too in the weeds of, of production, yeah. but like, are there, are there, are you think, are you looking at something and saying, well, we really shouldn't do anything with much background right now. So let's just anything. Yeah, I mean, in fact, one, you know, the film that we've got, um, you know, that we're about to start shooting does not have any background, right. which is great. Um, you know, and it has very few, uh, few characters. And really at its core, it's a story about two people um, on a mountain. So I any, think- You can shoot anywhere. Exactly. Yeah. So- um, Have you had to look at different locations as places have spiked or, or not? Um, or have you been able to sort of settle on one place and just be like, we're gonna bubble it here and do it in a certain way and-, and uh, yeah, that's that's ultimately, yeah. and we did. We looked at we looked at you know at lots and lots of different places all over. Um, and part of that was also kind of uh, monetary as well. But really, it was also you know very much in in our minds was you know we need to we we really wanted to create a bubble that just seemed like the safest way. You know, for the whole movie really, the cast, the crew, and then actually the movie going forward itself. You know, it's just just kind of try and keep COVID out in that way. Um, you know, and we really didn't want to shoot anything in the city at the moment in New York City or, or London because it's just, it's tough. Have you mm -hmm. seen your COVID costs going up or down in recent months? Or flat? I, honestly, I haven't actually, I haven't really, right now they're kind of flat. We haven't really, we haven't actually started shooting. And we, although we did, we had, we did do a movie earlier on in 2020. It was all done remotely. So we had zero COVID costs. Um, yeah. Right. Not not bad. And so, where did you land location wise? Like, where where are you finding the loca the best the best locations to shoot? Is our our tax yeah. credit um, like a factor in there? Um, yeah, Kristen, are there particular countries that you're seeing movies going to, yeah. or are you seeing a lot of yeah. things? That, I mean, Australia, I feel like in New Zealand, probably international, basically. Yeah. I've I've got something shooting in Poland right now. Um, they the Polish government provides a COVID insurance policy. It doesn't protect against everything, but it protects against most things. The one thing that is not protected is if the government were to deem uh, film production not a necessary um, essential business, which right now it is. Um, and thus far we've been okay. It's been going smoothly. Um, yeah, so it's that, uh, you know, Finland is another one I hear a lot, Iceland, New Zealand, Australia, we have another thing going in a few months in Australia. Um, the, it, nothing though here, unless it's one of these two people in a room, non-union, shooting on the fly, like really kind of under the radar, just trying to do it for $500,000 is the only thing that can really happen in the U.S. Right I've got now. three people in a room. Uh, <laughs> uh, three people? Uh, with a studio paying through the nose for the privilege of doing it on a TV long form deal. Uh, uh, so, you know, you can do it that way too, I guess. Um, and get the same movie that you would if you had it for 500,000 non-union, but you know, people gotta eat, right? That's true. And so from a financing standpoint, have you seen the, you know, the typical players that you're going to for, for your equity and for your debt. Um, have you seen that dry, dried up at all? Have you had to find new sources of money? Um, or is, or are the, are the same players still more active than ever than ever? Like what, what is, what has shifted in the financing world since um, when, when you find a project that you really want to put together and the budget makes sense and you, and you start raising money? I would say we're going more, increasingly more to the end user, so distributors, to get a pre-buy or a backstop. Mm -hmm. um, because the equity, typical equity players are, they're, they're still engaging on stuff, they're looking at stuff, they seem to be actively looking, but there's definitely an air of caution. 
Um, and being a little conservative, uh, they'll respond to things. They'll want to know what the kind of financial picture of it is. Is it something that can shoot later this year or is it something that needs to go immediately? Um, they're definitely a little more conservative and cautious, especially when it comes to potential COVID costs ballooning out of control, which obviously there's been some horror stories. Um, so yeah, I'd say a lot of the stuff we're doing is going direct to the end user um, and just pre-selling it, which you know is great and there's uh, kind of a home for it. There's not a ton of upside, but mm -hmm. uh, that's that's way to just get it done. Gotcha, gotcha. How about how about from the producers? Easy, easier or harder to raise money? I mean, I think it was getting harder and harder anyway. Um, so, you know, I think it's just a continuation of, of that trend. But, you know, like Kristen said, we're, we're also looking towards the end user. We're looking at distributors now gotcha. um, to come on board that way. And also, you know, exploring internationally. Um, we're looking at different countries, different credits, different public funding, um, you know, really just looking at all the different ways we can try and, you know, maximize the money we can to, to make the film as as best we can, really. Right, right. Yeah, I feel like I feel like um, the old adage of um, you know engaging with your with your dentist to find the the best private money um, and and giving him a producer credit and having him walk the red carpet is no longer a thing. I think private money is fine is is becoming harder and harder to come by. Um, have you have you found that a specific genre is um, you're able to close on more financing or there's more interest on a specific genre of, 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 um, of film or is it kind of running, running the gamut? I'll ask that to you, David. You know, I'm not going to be the best served to respond because I probably deal in the least uh, volume of the three of us. And so as a result, I probably don't have as good a perspective into the different sort of pockets of the market. Um, what I'll, what I'll say again, and I, I was saying it sort of jokingly earlier, but I, but I do think it's important is when your end users are made up largely of um, global media conglomerates uh, that are taking money from Saudi Arabia and, and China, uh, it's very hard to know what you're supposed to be making um, and how you're ever going to get it out into the world as an independent producer if you realize that the real game in town is going to them and saying, do you want to make and distribute this? Um, right. So so as respect to genre, uh, again, I, I think anything, I think genre is fine. I think if you want to make something that doesn't necessarily conform with certain ideas, that's when you get into trouble. When it doesn't fit in the box, that's when there's your problem yeah problem. and so and 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 that's not accusing anyone of being malicious or 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 or, or anything um you know intentional on any individual's part it's just like that's what the system sort of allows for at this point um gotcha. until until there's a you know until the audience or the consumer or whatever decides it wants whatever the next thing is so would you say with i i would say that there's a there's a democratization of viewership, so to speak, that um, whatever type of film that I want to watch tonight, I'll, I'll be able to watch it. And it'll, it might cost $3. It might be what I'm already paying for monthly. But no matter what, what type of film, I can watch a foreign doc tonight on my TV if I wanted to. With that democratization of viewership, would you say, um, would you make the argument that there's a sort of democratization of, of film creation as well, where um, that it's, it's, it's almost like the taste profile of the entire country or the entire world is kind of going up, or would you say everybody's kind of gra gravitating towards the same thing and they're all kind of watching the same type of content. So um, it's actually homogenizing the product. I say it's dumbing down, but. <laughs> Yeah, and I think um, the challenge is the economic underpinnings of making art in America uh, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense on the basis of a, of a capitalistic system and we don't have any federal support for it and we don't have sufficient support for, for the, I mean, the arts, I mean, what, what's happening during COVID right now to the collective arts economy and the lack of, um, 
support federally when like, you know, the airline industry gets 57 billion um, is, is sort of galling when you think about how big of a financial driver this business uh, and just the arts in general is. Um, so yeah, I think that's, I think it's challenging when you don't have any support for something and you treat it the same as you do a Marvel movie uh, mm -hmm. and it's not the same thing. It's mm -hmm. just a public good. To flip that on its head, yeah. would you say that the, the, uh, the person tuning into this should be not really concerned at all with the type of film that they're making, that it's kind of an uphill battle anyway, so they might as well just make the film that they really believe in? Or should they be thinking about viewership, who's the end user, how this thing is going to be seen, um, or is it maybe a, a, a blend of the two? I mean, it's, it's got to be a bit of a blend, no? I mean, you have to really believe in what you're making. Otherwise, there's really no point in going ahead and spending all that time and effort doing it. But mm -hmm. at the same time, you have to weigh up, you know, a little bit who, who your audience is. Do people out there want to watch it? You know, maybe there are. Maybe there are three people that want to watch it. But then you kind of have to know that, okay, there are three people that want to watch it, not right. you know, right. a thousand or something. I think um, we're an industry that reward people who have make films that are with the exception of those who make things that are just so um, like either intentionally odious or just hard to access that, or they themselves are that, um, that, mm -hmm. that we just reject them. I'm, I can think of a couple of artists who, whose work I respect who like will never get any time of day from anybody because everyone's like, well, that person's difficult. Um, right. But like for the most part, I think when we see talented early work um, or talented low budget work or even talented, not necessarily hyper excessive work, we can see the potential in that. And so I think there's value in just making the stories you're able to make. I, I do wonder where that work, I do think to some extent, like the thing that you can hope for in this moment is that you're gonna make something small and then maybe through that get to then make something else. But that's, when has that also not always been the case, you know? Um, so maybe it's no different than it ever has been. That's, that's, that's an interesting segue to talking about, um, you know, the technological advances that have allowed people to make within or um, for me, if I had the, the gumption to go buy an iPhone 12 Pro with Dolby Vision and, and shoot my film for, for, you know, $38 in my backyard, it, it, do you see a, a non-set of um, very, very indie films, so to speak, these hundred dollar or anywhere from a hundred dollars to five thousand dollar films being made by um you know a 15 year old in kansas as opposed to a a, a you know ucla or usc graduate director um do you see that happening or is it um is it a question of whether those films are ever going to be seen or not uh i, I mean I hope that's happening. I think it's, I think we're competing against them. Those 15 year olds making TikToks, which is probably an uphill battle with that, with that iPhone 12. Um, I think the, you know, easy access to the tools to make films, I think can only be a good thing. I don't know. I don't think it will change anything for the people who aren't predisposed to, to make that work. Um, but for maybe for that, uh, that film student uh, who previously would have had to go and raise a hundred thousand dollars, they can go and raise less now. And, uh, and if all we get out of this, or one of the things we get at this moment in time is a bunch of micro budget films ushering in a new generation of filmmaking talent, then that will be a real boon to this industry. Do you think that's gonna, do you think that's gonna happen? Like, do you think those types of films or those types of content creators or those types of uh, screenwriters that are making the, the, the scripts for the $5,000 production, do you think that Kristen, they're ever gonna go to, like they're ever gonna see you? Like are, are those types of, films or scripts ever going to come across your desk or, and, and same with you Nick? Uh, yeah I mean since I've been doing this stuff always kind of rises to the surface short films stuff that's been made for a couple hundred dollars you know genre movies they made in their backyard uh, you know the stuff always rises to the top am I going to see all of it probably not um, but I guess okay, we're all in a situation. Safe. Yeah, exactly. for everyone's <laughs> sake, right? My sanity. Um, right. We're all gonna, you know, th this process of like independent film. It's almost like a, 
not necessarily a gatekeeper, but almost like the first step to the next step, which is like, we're all seeing the kind of first entree into the short film or their first feature or this emerging filmmaker out of some film school. That's how it always has been in this space. We're kind of like the discovery, uh, the discovery section almost. So right. whether they're shooting on a new iPhone or it had been whatever the new technology was when I started like 15 years ago, um, that's all the same. The people who want to make films are going to utilize those new technologies to make art. Um, and I think the good stuff will rise to the top. That's very hopeful. I don't know that I have much more to add to that, but I completely agree. I mean, it makes it, you know, it just, it makes it cheaper for everybody and, and the quality kind of rises for those that have less money than it, it did before. But I think really it's, it's still kind of the same. Right. Right. Yeah, I think I hope that comes out of this time as it relates to technology. I mean, if we get a bunch of great films made on iPhones, uh, all, all for it, right? Great. Um, but I think the thing that'll be interesting to see, and I don't, I don't have any perspective into it, so I, it's just hypothetical. But like, what, what from this moment of making films uh, under these circumstances will uh, uh, lead to uh, new ways of working as it relates to limiting the carbon footprint of our productions, mm -hmm. uh, and like, what new sort of things will we adopt in terms of just um, bringing down budgets, allowing technology to do some of the lift, uh, but also ideally just becoming a less wasteful industry. Um, right. So I think that would be interesting to see what comes out of it since I imagine that must be happening. Uh, I hope that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. I think from a from a health and safety perspective, you're you're looking at, um, you know, what is a film set on on location in Central Park? It's 200 people eating and and throwing trash away and and breathing the same air. Um, so I, if you can 3D scan Central Park and throw it on a 30 foot screen that has 8,000 pixels and it's a screen here and, a, and two screens here, and you put the actor in the in a practical set, it could be a really interesting way to. To, to make a film and, and absolutely reduce, reduce carbon footprint. I completely agree with that. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about, about Within because you were able to make it very quickly, Nick. You were able to make it, um, is it it's almost a, uh, would you consider a 100% remote production? Yeah, yeah, I would. Um, I mean, really, we, we did everything via Zoom. So, yeah. Um, okay. It was kind of amazing, you know, it came about from um, just, you know, once we went into lockdown and we left the office, uh, we started doing, like I'm sure everybody did, like daily team meetings in the morning and we just sort of started batting around some ideas and then, and one of them was to kind of, you know, try and help um, create these projects for people that were sitting at home and, you know, were just with their families and had scripts and ideas and things they wanted to do and, and help them write a script about their experience or something that was, you know, being triggered from this, like whatever it was. And people came up with really different, interesting ideas. And so, um, you know, we helped with them with that process. And then we um, put together a camera package and a sound equipment package for them, um, sent it out and then would have, uh, we'd have like a production meeting. It's not like we had a whole crew of people. It was really just us and then them. Right. And Dan and Zach, so uh, we had our sound consultant and our DP consultant who would, um, you know, we'd do a, basically a, a tech day with them where we'd walk them through how to use all the equipment um, and uh, and then kind of would have a, you know, like a little location walk through in their house and they would take Zoom and walk through showing us where the different locations were. And, um, and then, yeah, it, it was... It was very interesting. It, it almost sounds like, I mean, there's, there's, there, I'm sure there are filmmakers that are, that will be listening to this that are, are friends with each other and haven't been able to see each other in the past seven months. And they're all, they're all living in, in New York and wanting to make a film and they have no idea how right now. Um, so it, it's what, what's interesting is, um, it doesn't sound like it was any different than the way you would typically make a film. It was just, it was just all through Zoom or... Well, tell it was, me, walk pre me through it like was the pretty different. We were lacking in all the crew that you'd usually have to make right. an entire movie, which was <laughs> a little stressful. Right. Um, you know, because there's still, 
you know, we were working with SAG actors, so we had to be signatory to SAG. And, right. you know, you still have to do, there's lots of things, you know, there's lots and lots of positions on a film that people do that we suddenly didn't have people to do them because also we didn't have a lot of money to make it. So mm -hmm. then, you know, we as producers were taking on all of those roles. And funnily enough, there were things you didn't think about. At all. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, right. You know, um, so no, it, it was it was very different. It was a very interesting experience. And also we did it, we dived into it right at the very beginning when really nobody had started shooting anything remotely. So mm -hmm. there wasn't sort of any information out there. I was like, oh, how do we go about and do that? It was really just sort of coming up with a concept and diving in. But no, it was it was very different. Gotcha, gotcha. And then from the editing process, um, you know, how, how, walk me through the post process after this 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 um, you know you got this entire. It was kind of amazing. So we yeah. at the end of every shoot day, um, I would actually jump online um, with our filmmakers via Zoom. And they'd give me access to then upload all of their, and I'd walk them through how to plug in, you know, how to get the card out of the sound, you know, how to plug in the phone and transfer all. <laughs> yeah. And then I would sit there all night <laughs> transferring data to our lab in Portugal, um, oh, wow. who would then, um, you know, do what they needed to do to get it to our editor Tarek in LA. Um, and that's how we did it. It was gotcha. It was a bit crazy. That's that's incredible. Um, I'm sure I'm sure just the fact that this that this project exists is uh, is um, you know something that I think a lot of people tuning in will will find positive and, and hopeful and and if 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 large scale productions can can do it then then smaller scale can as well. Um, sure. So I I find that I find that really hopeful. Um, I have questions here in regards to distribution and streamers and and uh, you know restructuring and 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 all of that. We, we we've covered a lot of different topics, but to get more granular into, uh, we'll start with distribution. Um, uh, Kristen, when you're talking about um, you know uh, the end user being the being the the uh, being essentially the financier. Can you talk to us about you know the the recent shift from Warner Media, um, you know, releasing all of their blockbusters on HBO Max and and, and the theater at the same time? Um, what the future of exhibition is, if if that's even important to talk about for the independent filmmaker, because there there's no way the independent film is ever going to be in the theater anyway, um, and and that could be the answer too. But I, I'm curious to know how your clients think about what where their film is going to be seen. I don't necessarily think it's going away. Um, mm -hmm. I think the theatrical experience and, and from what I'm seeing and talking to a lot of um, distributors about is uh, many of them that have kind of staked their reputation on being theatrical distributors are going to double down um, on that when things start to turn around. Obviously right now that's not the case. Right. Um, and people are focusing more on, you know, what could work for PVOD uh, and more VOD titles, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to focusing on more theatrically driven films. But I would say a lot of people went into Sundance, uh, you know, the more traditional independent distributors saying that, you know, toward the end of this year, we're gonna refocus our efforts back toward theatrical and really double down on it because they feel that people are gonna come back to the theaters in a big way. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. <laughs> it remains to be seen. Uh, this is all, you know, everyone has no idea how this is gonna go. So they're just going with what they feel is the right path for their, their business model. Um, and everyone's different. I think some traditional theatrical industry distributors really went for the VOD, like um, Neons of the World and IFC, like really mm -hmm. have been releasing a lot of movies during this time, not theatrically at all, um, mm -hmm. and have been doing it successfully. Um, then others, uh, you know, like Sony Classics of the World or A24 have been just waiting. They're not mm -hmm. releasing movies really. They're not buying a ton of movies. They have a lot of movies shelved from last year that they're gonna release later on. So they're kind of hoping that that comes back in a big way. Um, obviously going on the trend of the streamers obviously are <laughs> ruling the roost right now across the board. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say, you know, we're selling movies to everyone. We're selling movies to the streamers, to the day and day players, to the traditional theatricals. 
everyone's engaging unless they have categorically decided to wait until this is basically over, which there are those. Um, so it's interesting. I don't know that anything has changed fundamentally, except basically expedited the process to what it is now, which is places that are staking a lot of their company, like Warner Media, on streaming, going full throttle for that. Um, places like Disney, with Disney Plus and now Hulu, um, really going full throttle for that. Um, so, you know, I think it just really put the accelerator on a lot of things that were already in motion. But in terms of an actual like independent theatrical market, I don't, I don't know what it's going to look like in a year. I have no crystal ball for this, sure, yeah. <laughs> but people are optimistic that there will be a world and whether it has to be eventized or how, or it has yeah. to be in, like how you set market it. I'm not quite sure yet. I'm not a distributor, um, but I do think there will be a world where it exists again um, in, in some form of what it was. Uh, so I, you know, will the world just be streaming from now on for, you know, movies that need a lot of money and um, are more broad? Uh, yes, <laughs> but uh, I think there will be places for the little guy too um, and more personal stories. And that that's, I, I don't think that's going anywhere. I don't think it has to be just Netflix movies. That's That's both heartening to hear and of course makes me immediately wonder too, things um one being what happens if q4 2021 is not uh what they're hoping it will be and in fact like we still are either just getting back out of this or still living some sort of non-theatrical going life um like what who's what does everyone's contingency plan look like amongst <laughs> those guys uh can they pivot uh also like if like what is the rate of like sort of theater going going to have to be and at what rate will it have to ramp up for everybody's numbers to look good enough for them to be able to float through this I mean it's, there's just so many like questions and it's um I don't envy any of those people having to to try and figure it out um, <laughs> neither yeah. do I they you know I'm not a distributor so I don't have those kind of nuances in it but I no. think um for us you know as an sales agent, I'm just trying to find the best place for it to live. So as long as there's a home for it, to me, it doesn't make all that much of a difference of whether it ends up on a streamer or a traditional theatrical. Of course, we always try and handle it with a, you know, delicate hand. Like if this is a movie that needs a special treatment, of course, we're not just going to like throw it up on whatever day and day platform. Um, but you know, I think, uh, <laughs> I wish I knew the about answer. where we are after a year, right? Like it's mm -hmm. now nobody would, nobody would blink at a, at a streaming release versus a theatrical. That's a, that's, that's a, that's a lifeboat. Um, I mean, we've come oh, totally. so far even just in a couple of years. Um, I also can't help but wonder like what the everybody's still buying right now means if some people aren't releasing. And so like what the lag will be or how much bandwidth everyone will have to buy once things open back up. Um, but maybe the ramp up for production will be slow. I, I guess we'll see, right? There's just like so many. Um, exactly. There's going to be a bit of a, it's going to come to a head a bit where it's like the ramp up of production hasn't quite gotten to where people anticipated and then people needing stuff for their pipelines for the end of this year and the beginning of next year. Yeah, so we do get a, I get a lot of, yeah. Actors and directors only being able to be in one place and like yeah. people all being booked <laughs> to 16 things. Not with Zoom, you can be in a hundred <laughs> places. <laughs> Incredible. What what's the what's the one piece of advice that you would give? And I'm realizing that we have like two minutes left. So what what is the what is the piece of advice that um, you'd give to um, a South by Southwest attendee who's tuning in and um, is is wanting to be a filmmaker or is in the process of being a filmmaker and um, and just as they were launching their dreams, the world shuts down. What what piece of advice would you would you give them to to get through this difficult time or or, or perhaps uh, uh, pivot? I'll start with you, David. Uh, somebody said it on this Zoom earlier, but it um, 
it's of course true, which is that, um, and it's been written about, and this is not going to be uh, particularly like new to say, but like the, the sky has frequently been falling in the 15 or so years since I've started working in this business, uh, whether that was DVDs or uh, the economy or foreign sales or the streamers coming in. Uh, like it's, it's always been something. Uh, uh, and um, that's probably reflective of like an industry whose economic fundamentals aren't great um, amongst other things. Uh, and that's okay because if you're in, if you're a filmmaker or if you're an artist or you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to work in this space, you're coming at it understanding there's tremendous risk, uh, a certain amount of um, just ingrained insanity um, uh, in both like the business and the people and the artists and that's just part of the thing. And so uh, I guess what I'd say is out of times of past disruption, it's felt like there's been great opportunity and work made. Um, and I look even at like the companies that came out of the economic downturn um, and uh, whether that's A24 or Netflix uh, and they've remade the entertainment industry in the last 10 years. Um, so uh, yeah, keep on doing your thing unless this makes you wanna go work in climate change, in which case go do that. <laughs> Nick? Yeah, I think if this, is, if this is what you know you want to do, if you really know that this is what you wanna do, if not, absolutely go and do something else. Um, then just just keep keep doing it and be adaptable, be nimble, try and, I don't know, figure out however you can do it, do it, I think is really, it's honestly how we've always done it. And I think that's what you've just got to keep doing. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Great. Kristen? Yeah, I mean, just keep honing it. Uh, eventually we will come out of this and there will be a world you know, a business, what it looks like exactly. None of us really know, but it will be here. <laughs> um, so just keep honing the stories. Original stories are always going to find their place um, and kind of rise to the top. So just keep working on that original voice, all while still, I think, uh, observing what goes on in the marketplace, uh, what movies sell, what movies work, um, just having a general knowledge of what's out there and how things work. I think the days of like the kind of introverted um, filmmaker who just kind of does their thing in a closet um, <laughs> are kind of um, a little antiquated because I think you really have to have an awareness of what's out there. At the end of the day, yes, it's art, but it's also commerce and they have to converge. And uh, I think I, I always have the best experience with uh, filmmaker clients who have a pretty in-depth knowledge of how uh, the financing and um, distribution process works. And they're usually, the experience for them and us is usually uh, quite beneficial when that is the case. So just having like, a, like, where do you want your films to live? Do you want Neon to distribute them? Is like A24 your dream eventually? Like what kind of career do you want to have? So a more like longer term vision is always nice, I think. <laughs> That's great. Nick, Kristen, David, thank you so much for, for, for doing this and for, for sharing your, your knowledge, your, your 15 plus years of experience. I, I, I think I, I learned probably as much as uh, anybody listening in on this. So I, I really appreciate the three of you taking the time. Um, how, can, how can people get in touch with you um, uh, further if they'd like? Email is easy. Email me. <laughs> yeah. Send a carrier yeah. pigeon. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> there you go. Great. Uh, we'll put we'll put emails in in um in the description of this and um and once again thank you um the three of you for doing this. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, yeah. We'll speak soon. Bye guys. Bye. Bye.